This week on the podcast, MIT biologist Lenny Guarente talks about the genetics of longevity and what the findings mean for healthy lives in general. Cornell University anthropologist Meredith Small discusses some cross-cultural issues at the other end of the age spectrum in babies. And Carnegie Mellon electrical and computer engineer M. Granger Morgan tells us about a startling new study of personal electronic devices on airplanes. Plus, we'll test your knowledge of some recent science in the news. First up, MIT's Lenny Guarente. He spent the last 15 years studying the genes that regulate aging. And he and David Sinclair wrote the cover story in the March issue of Scientific American about genes and aging and the implications of his research. I called him at his office in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Dr. Guarente, thanks for talking to us today. It's my pleasure. You have the article, uh, the cover article in the March issue of Scientific American, Unlocking the Secrets of Longevity Genes. Uh, let's talk about the genetics of longevity. Uh, conventional wisdom always had it that aging was a function of normal maintenance mechanisms going awry as, as you got older. Well, I think there's some truth to that idea. But what one has to keep in mind is that there are times in which aging is regulated. And this was really first uh, known from uh, the time uh, people started burying the diets in laboratory animals. And they noticed that calorie restriction could make rodents live up to twice as long. And we've seen calorie restriction also have a, a profound effect on, on lifespan in other organisms as well. That's right. I believe this is a universal in nature that uh, low calorie diets promote longevity. In humans, we can at least say that some of the markers, the physiological markers for longevity are affected by the diet. It, studies to look at lifespan, uh, of course, are difficult and very long term, so there's no information yet on that. But there's every reason to think that the effect of calorie restriction will be universal. The important thing about it is uh, to ask the question, how does it work? And that's where the genes come in. Okay, so let's talk about that. What's the genetics that uh, wind up coming into play with calorie restriction? Well, we uh, encountered a gene in our studies in yeast some 15 years ago called SIR2 or SIR2. And we, we, what we found is that that gene was an anti-aging gene. So the more active it was, the longer the lifespan. It turns out that this gene is universal. Uh, all critters have it. We have it. And what we think the gene does is respond to the environment, and in particular uh, to food, and uh, uh, exert effects on cells that will determine how long the organism as a whole will survive. Okay, a lot of the, the uh, calorie restriction conventional wisdom was that you slowed down metabolism and you didn't have the waste products of metabolism. But, that, but you don't think that's what's happening? That's not true. Calorie restriction does not slow down metabolism. What it does is it alters the metabolic strategy, and it alters it in a way that th this gene, SIR2, and its cousins, there are seven uh, of these genes in total in mammals, uh, these genes can recognize that alteration in metabolism and exert effects on cells that makes them uh, survive longer. Can you talk a little bit about what SIR2 actually does? Well, we were really amazed to find that the SIR2 gene product, which is a protein, has an enzymatic activity that has never been observed before. It can modify uh, proteins by removing uh, acetyl groups, so it's a so-called deacetylase. And there are other deacetylases in cells, but what was unique about the SIR2 deacetylase is that it requires a cofactor for its activity. And the cofactor is a molecule called NAD, which is a small molecule in cells involved in metabolism. So it's that fact that SIR2 requires NAD, a metabolic conduit, and has an ability to modify proteins that told us that it might be the, the connector, the nexus between metabolism, and that is diet, and regulation of cell biology. So I think that the activity was uh, uh, really the, 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 the critical uh, uh, discovery along the path of SIR2 biology. By the way, what does SIR2 stand for? SIR stands for Silent Information Regulator. Uh, and two, it was the second gene in yeast of this uh, type. So it's involved in yeast in a process that's called silencing. 
And can you explain that real briefly? Silencing uh, uh, is the uh, uh, turning off of specific genes in the genome. So SIR2 in yeast has the ability of turning off regions uh, of the yeast genome. And one of those regions in yeast uh, is involved in dictating how long cells live. So what, what do you think the future can hold in terms of what we're going to do with this knowledge? Well, let me talk about that for a minute. So I, I think that if one understands the mechanism, the genes and how they work, then one has uh, a path to developing drugs that could deliver the same benefits of calorie restriction without the difficulty of the diet itself. And I think that's a goal. Now, the, that said, uh, you might ask the question, well, why do we want to do that? And I think the compelling reason for doing it is not to, to make people live longer, but the, the uh, thing about calorie restriction that's not appreciated is in the rodent in which it's been studied, calorie restriction not only extends lifespan, but it prevents or mitigates many different diseases of aging, including cardiovascular disease, cancer, neurodegenerative disease, diabetes, the major diseases of aging. So it's my belief that if we could harness uh, 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 the benefits of calorie restriction in people, it wouldn't simply be uh, uh, an act of making people live longer, but it would uh, provide a new strategy to attack the major diseases of aging. I hope that the, the article conveyed how excited we the scientists who are doing this work are. The fact that there are these genes that nature has, has tailored to, to, to do this, that is to say, to to, to convey uh, uh, information about the environment to uh, setting the lifespan of the organism, I think it's a, a wonderful opportunity for us as scientists and uh, uh, as a society to uh, really develop new strategies to look uh, for uh, cures or at least uh, palliatives for human diseases. Thank you very much, Dr. Garanti. Thank you. There's a lot more on genes, aging, and health in Garanti and Sinclair's article, called Unlocking the Secrets of Longevity Genes. It's in the March issue of Scientific American and is available free for a limited time at our website, www.siam.com. And also check out Lenny Garante's book about his work. It's called Ageless Quest. Now it's time to play Totally Bogus. Here are four science stories. Three are true. See if you know which one is Totally Bogus. Story 1. Japanese researchers have developed a technique to extract the sweet-smelling substance vanillin from cow dung. Story 2. Blondes are almost done having more fun. A World Health Organization study led researchers to conclude that there are fewer and fewer blondes, well, natural blondes, and that the last natural blonde will likely be born in Finland around the year 2202. Story 3. A cosmonaut wants to hit a golf ball from the International Space Station. The ball would zip around the Earth for about four years until its orbit decayed and it burned up. Story 4. A study of Dutch men found that those who ate a lot of cocoa actually cut their risk of dying from cardiovascular disease in half. We'll be back with the answer. But first, Cornell University anthropologist Meredith Small generated a great deal of buzz with a recent op-ed piece. I called Small at her home in Ithaca, New York. <laughs> Professor Small, thanks for being with us. It's great to be here, Steve. So you had an op-ed piece in the New York Times so a few weeks ago that I remember reading, and uh, you got some interesting reaction to that, I understand. Tell us about the piece and the reaction you got. The, the Times came to me and asked me if I would write an, a comment on this growing movement in the United States to take babies as soon as they're born and start putting them on the toilet instead of wearing diapers. And it's called the Diaper Free Movement. It has a website. It has I don't know how many people doing this. And the idea is that you train your kids right away and you never have to put them in any kind of diapers. So I wrote the op-ed from an anthropologist point of view saying, well, this doesn't surprise me at all because if you look around in other cultures, they don't have diapers, they don't have cloth, they don't have um, disposable diapers, and these kids are trained right away. And by the time they can walk and talk, they know exactly where to go to go to the bathroom. So the article was published, and to my great surprise, 
it caused a flurry of email. It was the number one emailed article that week. It was one of the top emailed ones um, of the month. It was just crazy. And I got all kinds of email from people and telephone calls. And strangely enough, when I walked up to pick up my daughter at school, all these parents wanted to talk about it. The one that I found most interesting was a friend of mine, a guy, and he said, when I went to a cocktail party on Friday, it's what everybody was talking about. And well, I Are you laughing. sure that they didn't think you were talking about the movement-free diaper? <laughs> okay, it's the diaper-free movement. That's right. All right. <laughs> so it turns out it was a big discussion at a cocktail party. And I don't know, this seems to have hit the hearts of many people who are parents and non-parents, the idea of having little kids who are able to sleep through the night and not wear a diaper, get up in the morning, put them on the pot, and then they can run around half naked the rest of the day. And you came across this kind of interesting cross-cultural difference in the course of researching a, a general book on the subject? Yeah, for about the past, oh, almost 10 years, I've been working as an anthropologist on parenting in different cultures. And uh, I've written a couple of books, Our Babies, Ourselves, and Kids, and now I'm working on a parenting advice book. But I'm doing it from the voice of these other people in other cultures. So I'm going to ask the same questions that you see in books like what to expect when you're expecting, and then I'm going to answer them from other cultures. Thanks a lot, Meredith. You're very welcome. Meredith Small's last book was called Kids, How Biology and Culture Shape the Way We Raise Young Children. Now it's time to find out which story was totally bogus. Let's review the four stories, three of which are real. Story one, you can get perfumey vanillin from cow dung. Story two, the last blonde will be born in Finland in about 200 years. Story three, a cosmonaut wants to whack a golf ball into orbit. And story four, Dutch chocolate-eating men cut their cardiovascular disease deaths in half. The first story is true. Japanese researchers can get vanillin from cow dung. Vanillin is a common ingredient in candles and shampoo. The fourth story is true. Dutchmen who ate a lot of cocoa cut their risk of dying from all diseases in half. You can read the details of that study on our website, www.siam.com. The third story is true. A cosmonaut does want to drive a golf ball from the space station. A Canadian golf club company would sponsor the stunt. But NASA would have to give the green light, and some scientists are worried that the ball might actually hit something important, like a satellite, and put a hole in one. Which means that the story about blondes going extinct is totally bogus. Now, if you think you saw this story in the news recently, you did. A study on the evolution of blondes got some attention recently, and some versions mentioned the WHO Blonde Extinction Report, but that report was a hoax perpetrated in 2002, according to the website museumofhoaxes.com. Yes, there is a website, museumofhoaxes.com. And yes, there will be blondes for, well, presumably for a long, long time. Next up, M. Granger Morgan, head of Carnegie Mellon University's Department of Engineering and Public Policy. He and three co-authors just published a study about possible problems from using cell phones and other electronic devices on airplanes. I called Morgan from a landline at his office in Pittsburgh. Dr. Morgan, thanks for talking to us today. You're most welcome. You have a study along with your co-authors in the issue of IEEE Spectrum that ran in March. As a, a nervous flyer to begin with, I wasn't particularly pleased with your results. Uh, you want to tell us a little bit about the study? Sure. Wireless technology is becoming ubiquitous, and more and more of us are spending time on airplanes. And uh, we began to wonder a few years ago whether uh, uh, the combination of those two might present some problems for avionics and, and uh, navigation systems on airplanes. And as we began to look into it, we discovered that no one had actually ever measured the RF environment, that is the radio emissions within the cabin of commercial airliners. And that's due to all the electronic devices that people will typically use in a, in a flight. Yeah, computers and cell phones and Game Boys and all those sorts of things. And so with uh, full support from FAA and, uh, and uh, several U.S. airlines and the uh, 
TSA, we built a little box that, that looks just like an innocuous carry-on bag, but inside it is a, a spectrum analyzer that allows us to look at radio emissions in the cabin of the airplane. And so we then flew it on 37 commercial flights, putting it under seats or in, in the overhead uh, compartments, just like any other luggage. The results of, of that kind of uh, monitoring are, are really startling. Yeah, well, uh, <laughs> we discovered that, uh, first of all, as, as you might suspect, a lot of people forget to turn off their cell phones, and so you get regular uh, little bleeps there with the cell phone saying, here I am, are you out there? But then we also found regular use of cell phones, people making calls, including calls in flight critical phases, like during climb out and on final approach. That's troubling. We also, however, found emissions in the GPS band. Now, GPS is the global positioning system, and it's increasingly being used for precision landing and other navigation purposes. And uh, though we didn't study this, NASA has determined that there are at least some, there's at least one model of, of cell phone that can actually cause a GPS receiver to lose satellite lock. If that happened in, you know, a foggy uh, final approach, it could be really quite serious. We should say that, according to the study, there are no accidents, commercial aircraft accidents, that can be directly traced to any kind of problem like this. Yes, and we also think that probably this is not, at the moment, a a big risk. But on the other hand, as more and more people fly with wireless devices, it also says to us we need to start being careful. There are proposals afoot, for example, to start allowing cell phones on airplanes uh, with a microcell on the aircraft. We think you shouldn't rush into that. We also think it would be a good idea if the FAA, the people who regulate airlines, and the FCC, the people who regulate uh, radio emissions, would start co uh, cooperating on the standards. At the moment, standards set by the FCC aren't coordinated with the idea that a lot of these things might end up on airplanes. And finally, we think it would be good to start actually monitoring the environment in uh, cabins, both to get a better sense than we've been able to produce of what the environment looks like, and also because if you ever do have an accident, if you don't have monitoring like that, you'd probably never figure out that it came from radio interference. How can people be using their cell phones currently when you are warned or advised at any rate on every commercial flight to turn off your cell phone and not to use it in flight? Yeah, well, it turns out a lot of people don't believe that that's a safety announcement. Uh, a lot of people think that this is uh, the folks who put in the seat back phones that are so expensive trying to enforce a monopoly. That's not the case. Uh, and, you know, people know that occasionally... Or calls get made from the air, and so they uh, they simply don't appreciate that this really is a significant uh, uh, safety issue and uh, proceed to use their phones. The article talks about one specific case of a DVD player and a GPS, a huge GPS error. You want to talk about that? Yeah, this is the one where the 30-degree uh, uh, heading error. Yes. Uh, and the flight crew went back and asked folks to turn off the... Uh, the device and the uh, uh, error went away and they asked them to turn the device back on, something I think they probably couldn't do today, but uh, did then, and, and the error resumed. There have been a bunch of reports like this. There is actually a, a database maintained by NASA in which flight crews and others can report events, and we've done a fair amount of statistical analysis of that database, uh, trying to get a sense of how common these kinds of events are. Uh, and they're common enough to be troubling. So for now, based on your study, uh, you want the FAA and the FCC to get on the same page, and, and what else? Yeah, well, the other thing is that we would like uh, uh, some substantially more detailed analysis of what is going on in the uh, uh, cabins of airliners, and we would like uh, folks to go slow on any proposals to introduce uh, uh, expanded use of wireless on aircraft until we know just exactly how big a problem we've got and what might be done uh, to better deal with it. Dr. Morgan, thank you very much. You are most welcome. Morgan's article is currently available online at www.spectrum.ieee.org. <laughs> <laughs>